Hi there, I'm going to show you a very simple way to build a universal RF amplifier that will work from 0 kHz to a few gigahertz. I'll show you all the design steps, the schematic, component selection, layout and actual measurements. Let's get started. So what am I talking about here? I'm talking about standard RF game blocks in a SOT89 package. And here you see a small selection from mini circuits on the DigiKey website, not sponsored by either of these. And you see the price, they're very cheap. And you see the frequency range, which you see you have a pretty huge selection. You have a huge selection of 1 dB compression points. You have these things up to 32 dBm, but they're a little bit more complicated than what I'm going to show here. Different gains and different noise figures. A number of manufacturers make gain blocks in this exact same package. So the selection is huge. So for this video, I selected two options, a low power version and a high power version. So on the left, we see the low power version. It's the S66 plus. 3 GHz bandwidth, 16 decibels of gain, a 2.4 decibels noise figure. This is why I selected this one, very low noise figure. And a compression point of 3.3 dBms. I also selected the high power version. It only has a 1 GHz bandwidth. In hindsight, I should have picked something with a little bit more bandwidth. That would have been better. 30 dB of gain, 2.7 decibels of noise figure, and 19 dBms of output power, which is quite a lot. So what do these things look like? Well, let's start on the right top where we see the application diagram. The IC is in the middle and all you need is two blocking capacitors and one resistor to bias it and a power supply. So you can see how ridiculously simple this is. Now the bias resistor needs to be set based on the power supply voltage. So in this case for the S66 plus is 300 ohms at nine volts, which I will be using. So on the inside, this is a very simplified diagram from the data sheet. It's basically two transistors in series in some sort of Darlington configuration and apparently they managed to get this matched on the in and the output and this is the pinout that we're looking at here. So this is the schematic design I made for this test. So it looks a lot like the application diagram. We have two SMA connectors. It says SMB here, but you can put SMA in there as well. 22 nanofarad coupling capacitors, the actual amplifier, the 300 ohm resistors, a ferrite bead as an option, but I can also put a resistor there, a high frequency decoupling capacitor and a low frequency decoupling capacitor. So let's have a closer look at the component selection and let's start with the resistors. Now in SMD resistors you have two main choices, thick film and thin film. The thin film resistors are generally much better for linearity and 1 over F noise and temperature coefficients and things like that, but they're generally a lot more expensive. However, the MELF thin film resistors are very cheap. They're only 5 cents a piece for 10 pieces. The advantage is they're quite a high power, 400 milliwatts. So that makes them a very good choice for a, for a hobbyist. It's a cheap, good resistor. So let's look at the capacitors. We have two coupling capacitors, which are 22 nanofarad NP0 capacitors. They are low loss, high Q, because you don't want any loss or distortion here in this path. And we have a decoupling capacitor that's also an NP0, because you also want low loss there. Now let's have a look at the ferrite bead. What is a ferrite bead? Well, it's basically an inductor, but with a high loss. Now, normal inductors have a really low loss. And when you combine those with capacitors, like you want to make a filter, it has the tendency to resonate like crazy. These things, however, have a very very high resistive components, which basically dampens that resonance. So you see here the impedance characteristic versus frequency, and you see the huge resistive component, which really nicely damps any kind of unwanted resonance, which is great. This makes these things great for power supply filtering. Now let's have a look at the layout. The layout is really simple. We have the input and the output connector here. We have our one, two, coupling capacitors, we have our active device. Here we have the two resistors and the ferrite bead, the high frequency decoupling cap, low frequency decoupling cap, and the power connector. So we have a 50 ohm transmission line here and there are two things important about the trans 50 ohm transmission line. First, it has to be 50 ohm. And second, planes right next to it must be grounded well enough. I've shown this in part four of my flawless PCB design series. Check that out if you want to know more about it. These are enough vias to make sure that these planes do not get standing waves on them. Now to look at the transmission line, I've filled in all the information here on a uh, microstrip calculator that I found on the MIT website. 0.35 millimeters, these are the standard settings for uh, FR4 material, the dielectric is 0.19 millimeters thick. And yeah, you get an impedance of 47 ohms, which is uh, close enough for good performance. So this is the actual assembled board. We see the big connectors here, the big RF connectors, the power supply connectors, decoupling caps, biasing. Well, actually it speaks for itself. 
So if you want to become a professional electronic specialist as well, I'm working on two courses, a product development course and an analog amplifier design course. These are meant for professionals and they are not free. However, you can also download my free checklist or watch all my videos and learn a lot. All the links are in the description. So let's start having a look at measurements. Now for the measurements of this circuit, I have three options. The first option is the standard as you see it here, where F1, however, is a one ohm resistor. And this gives a high pass characteristic of 85 kilohertz. Now I was curious to see if changing these large input and output capacitors to small ones, like 100 picofarad, would improve the performance because these smaller capacitors are generally better at higher frequencies. So that gives you a high pass characteristic of 24 megahertz. And the final thing I wanted to do is replace this one ohm resistor with the actual ferrite bead I showed before to see what that does for the performance. Let's have a look at the two measurement setups. We have a gain measurement setup and a compression measurement setup. Now there are two things that are important. First of all, that we don't compress our amplifiers because if they start compressing, then we measure the wrong gain. And the second thing is to protect our equipment. We do not want too much power to enter our equipment, which makes it break. A nano VNA produces minus eight dBms and the one dB compression point of the amplifier that we're using with the most gain is 15 dBms. So if I place a 30 dB attenuator in front of the amplifier and then have 46 dB of gain, then we get at plus 16 dBs of gain, which turns the minus 8 into plus 8. This is 7 decibels away from the 1 dB compression point, so we should be okay. Now the maximum output power of this amplifier is around 20 dBms. The maximum power the nano VNA can take is plus 7 dBms. So if we place a 20 decibels attenuator behind the amplifier, we are guaranteed not to damage our nano VNA. Now in order to calibrate our nano VNA, we remove the amplifier, so directly connect these two attenuators, and then we use that to calibrate for the gain measurement. So the compression measurement is a little bit simpler because I'm using an actual signal generator which can control the power with 0.1 dB steps. For measuring the output power, I'm using a spectrum analyzer. And uh, the spectrum analyzer can deal with a maximum input of 20 dBm and the amplifier can deliver 20 dBm. So a 10 dB attenuator in between will protect the spectrum an analyzer from any damage. Let's see what the setup looks like. We have a power supply, a nano VNA, measurement cables and attenuators and the nano VNA saver software running on Python to communicate. Here we see a closer look at it. We see our single amplifier design here, 30 dBs of attenuators in front of the amplifier, 20 dBs behind it. Now this is the setup for the compression measurement. We have our power supply again, an old HP signal generator, a signal hound spectrum analyzer and the signal hound spike software. I'm really impressed by this USB spectrum analyzer which runs off USB only and has an incredible price performance ratio. Let's have a look at the measurement results. So we have three options that I described before. Uh, we can have 100 pico and the bead, which is the more RF option. Uh, down to the 22 nano and 1 ohm, which is more the low frequency option. Now let's see if that makes any difference. So we see that the low frequency option, you can see it here, it continues basically to zero, has indeed a little bit of a lower gain at one gigahertz. Uh, if I change the coupling capacitor from 22 nano to 100 pico, we see a roughly 2 dB increase. And if we replace the one ohm resistor with the ferrite bead, we see another one dB increase. And this number is actually extremely close to the data sheet at one gigahertz. I think the data sheet states 20.3 typical, and this looks like it's 20.7. Now let's have a look at the compression characteristics. So the first thing you notice, the gain here is 19.3. That's not a 20.7. And that's because um, a network analyzer is extremely accurate when measuring gain. And when you use a separate signal generator and a separate spectrum analyzer, then the errors are not calibrated. And these, these pieces of equipment actually have an error. And uh, being within a dB is, is quite okay. So what you see here on the x-axis is the input power. Uh, of the amplifier and on the y-axis you see the output power and the gain. It may be hard to see here but the gain drops at some point the signal doesn't fit anymore it just starts to run into the supply or in other limitations of the device and the signal drops. The 1 dB compression point that we get here is minus 0.7 dBm's so at minus 0.7 dBm the deviation downwards here on this yellow line is 1 dB and the deviation on the gain is 1 decibels as well. Now I can show this in a little bit more detail. This is the gain zoomed in and you see that at low levels it's 19.3. 
at minus 19 dBms of input level, we're looking at 18.3, so the gain has reduced by one decibel. Now we can also look at the output power in more detail, this is the output power, and if we look at minus 19, we get to minus 0.7 dBm. Now the nice thing of these amplifiers is you can cascade them, and I also made a two-stage design. And this, for the second stage I used the S74 amplifier that I already showed some specifications of in the beginning. Now you see that the application schematic is exactly the same, it's just that the biasing resistor is different because this thing produces a lot more power, so it needs a lot more quiescent current. So at 9 volts we see that we need 53.6 ohm for optimum biasing. Now this is the application schematic. The left side is exactly the same as we had, but we just added another one of these amplifier stages. And you see, the schematic is an exact copy, just cascaded together. And these resistors are different, so we use 22 and 33, added together is 55, which is very close to the required value. So this is the layout. Yeah, not much to say here, it's just copy the same thing twice, put a decoupling capacitor in between, and you're done. So, very simple. And this is the actual finished board. You can see the resistors here, 22 and 33. I don't think I need to add any more to this. It's just a, two copies of the same thing. For measurements, I wanted to try two options here as well. Um, so we have an 85 kilohertz high pass option that uses 22 nanofarad capacitors here everywhere. The beads are one ohm resistors and they have a 20 megahertz high pass option more for high frequencies where these three capacitors have been changed to 100 picofarad and the two ferrite beads are now actually ferrite beads instead of one ohm resistors. So what do the measurement results look like? With the RF option at 1 GHz we get a little bit over 40 decibels of gain and with the low frequency option we get about 2 dB less, just like we saw with the other amplifier. And um, yeah, as we know the second stage has a 1 GHz bandwidth so it, it drops quite hard here. I could have chosen a more high bandwidth uh, device here than these characteristics, characteristics would have been a little bit more flat. Now let's look at the compression point. We measure a 1 dB compression point of 15 dBm's at 1 GHz and a gain of 41 decibels. And um, yeah, those are pretty good numbers. A great thing to check when you build something new is to check the bias currents. And uh, if they're way off, then you're pretty much sure that there's something wrong with your circuit. So for the S66 Plus, we expected 16 milliamps, and I was measuring 18.4. So it's slightly higher. But since the maximum current is 50 milliamps for this device, it really isn't a problem. For the 74 plus we're a little bit closer, the expectation is 80 and we measured 77 and the maximum is 130. So we're pretty much safe there as well. As you can see these amplifiers are very easy to design and very useful to have around in your lab or to use in your designs. I used a lot of these amplifiers in the IF to video converter system of the Westerbork synthesis radio telescope almost 30 years ago now and they worked perfectly. So hope you enjoyed this video, see you next time.